We're in the 10th week of the sermon series, Issues. And today we're going to move from King Saul to David. But it's going to be a process, church, a process of time. It's going to take time to get the crown and the throne, y'all. Because unlike Saul, David wasn't immediately seated upon the throne. Before he was seated, God tested him. God prepared him. He humbled him. But let me add to the list, pummeled. I know you don't like that word, but before God uses someone, he pummels them. Or, or, or if you want to make it sound a little better, you could say prepare. But it's pummeled, y'all. It was A.W. Tozer said that before God greatly blesses a man, he hurts him deeply. And before David could sit upon the throne as king of Israel, God needed to sit upon the throne of David's heart. Come on, church, he needed to be the king of David's heart. And so he had to prepare him and to get him ready for the throne and to be the leader and the king of Israel. So God had to prepare him. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, Samuel the prophet said that God is looking for a man after the heart of God. How many have heard that before? God is looking for men and women with hearts after him. And remember it was the prophet, or God told the prophet to, to look at the hearts of David and his brothers and not their appearance. Because Paul, Saul was appointed as king by the people remember because he was a, a foot taller than everyone he looked like a king he appeared as a king but God said don't look at their appearance come and look at their heart and then in Acts 13 22 God said I found my man y'all he, he said I got it I found the guy I've been looking for. And some of you ladies wish you could say that today. I know. Somebody say, I need my man. <laughs> yes. He, he's your man. But God said, I got him. A, a man after my own heart. And he'll do everything that I ask him to do. He do, does everything that I want him to do. He does everything that my word says to do and then God says in in this verse Saul was removed and replaced by David see God is looking for the same thing in each and every one of us men and women who carry his heart come on who will do what he says to do what his word says to do regardless of what culture says to do regardless of how social media feels about it but we'll do what God's word says to do regardless of the consequences of our day and age and and regardless of what everyone says is right and what everyone says is wrong and which is vice versa to what God says and and everyone's trying to redefine things that can't be redefined because it was founded by God so regardless I'm looking for men and women God says who will carry my heart and will do what my word says to do who will contend for the word of God who will defend the word of God who will stand on the word of God regardless of what culture and the world is doing and I just wonder if God looked the sanctuary over today and, and it, would he find a few good men and women in the sanctuary today who carry his heart, who, who, who do what his word says to do. Because God is still looking for men and women who will do what he says to do. Because remember, Saul was removed because of what? Disobedience, y'all. Disobedience was the issue. Far too often, disobedience becomes the issue in the life of the believer, in the church, right? I pray that disobedience isn't your issue today. Or, or if you walked in and it is your issue that you walk out of this place in obedience, in the name of Jesus, you will. You can. The Bible says you can do all things through Christ who gives him you the strength. Amen? Saul had issues, but guess what? 
So did David. David had issues. Even this guy who had a heart for God, even this guy that God says, I found my man, even the anointed had issues. But remember, God uses our issues, right? Come on, he turns our issues into opportunities. And I'll go off as far as to say this. Some of our greatest issues will become some of our greatest opportunities. Because our greatest victories come from our greatest battles, right? Our greatest trophies come from our greatest trials. Our greatest testimonies come from our greatest tests. Our greatest breakthroughs come through our greatest brokenness. And great purpose will always come with and through great pain. See, God doesn't always remove our pain, our issues, our circumstances, our difficulties, our battles, but he will always move us through them. Come on. He, he doesn't always remove them, but he always moves us through them. And while David had issues, just like everyone sitting in this room today, and don't look at your neighbor, because they got issues, just like you do, but guess what? David wasn't the issue. Some of you need to understand that today. You might have issues, but you're not the issue. You know, later down the road, David was the issue, y'all, with the whole Bathsheba scandal and affair, but not today, not in this sermon. We're going to see that Saul is still the issue. And I want to start with David being anointed but I want to show you that with great anointing comes great attacks. See, just because you're anointed doesn't mean that you won't be attacked. In fact, it means you will be more so. The devil attacks the anointed. The devil attacks you because you're anointed, believer. He wouldn't attack you if you weren't so anointed. See, God cares more about our hearts than our position. And so before David could be seated, he had to be tested. He had to be pummeled or prepared, whatever. He had to be humbled before he was exalted to the king, to the throne, y'all. And, and the same is true with us. Before God seats us, he tests us. Come on, before he positions us, he pummels us. Before he exalts us, he humbles us. Okay, let's go to 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. That was my intro, and I know it was long. And Samuel took the flask of olive oil, and he anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And the Lord's Spirit came over David and stayed upon him from that day on. You, some of you remember that statement from your wedding vows, right? From, that, from this moment forward, right? How many said that? From this day on, from this moment forward, we shall be one. Sickness and health, dumbness and not, selfishness and can I keep going? I'll hit every one of you. The Message Bible says, for the rest of his life, he was anointed for the rest of his life. And in Psalms 30, verse 5, David said God's favor lasts a lifetime, not just for a moment, y'all, but a lifetime. When we walk in his favor, it lasts. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name, hold up before we pray. Can you help me pray? I'm, I'm severe, sincerely asking you to help me pray because I know this is a message for someone because God's been attacking me all week long preparing the message and so with great anointing comes great what attacking attacks attacking whatever and so I need you to help me pray that this message can be delivered to God's people today without attack come on let's put up a hedge of protection 
us raise up a standard in this place by your prayers right now in the mighty name of Jesus I pray the anointing power of Holy Ghost would hit this sanctuary today would hit this vessel would flow through the live stream today in the mighty name of Jesus through Holy Spirit double portion of in your anointing every attack of the enemy we rebuke you right now in Jesus' mighty name every attack on our hearts our minds our ears our eyes our lives our spouse our children our marriage our finances in the name of Jesus we rebuke to the devourer and the liar get thee behind me Satan get under my feet because that's where you belong we thank you for the anointing power that's flowing in this place today we thank you for the word that's going to be spoken the revelation that's going to be granted the, uh, the transformation that's going to take place the conviction the change in your mighty name everyone says amen amen the title of my sermon today is anointed and appointed everyone say anointed and appointed or it could be anointed and disappointed it's just all in how you see it or how you read it how do you see it come on how do you read it this morning is it anointed and appointed or is it anointed and disappointed See, David was anointed and appointed, church, but he was also anointed and disappointed because remember, he was anointed as king, but not yet appointed as king. How many know that can leave a person disappointed? So just like David, you are anointed and appointed this morning, but don't think I'm saying you're anointed to be king or queen. No. So don't be disappointed. So you can be anointed and disappointed the same time that you're anointed and appointed hmm? listen I've delivered many anointed sermons from this stage but I've left disappointed because I didn't get the results that I wanted so and so didn't repent so and so didn't get saved so and so's marriage wasn't restored so and so wasn't delivered from their addiction so and so didn't get up and run to the altar as soon as I said amen I didn't get the results that I wanted so I left disappointed but listen it wasn't God's appointed time and appointed time means his timing God has an appointed time it's not always my timing and so I know firsthand that you can be anointed and appointed, but also anointed and disappointed at the same time. How many know that to be true? Anointed means to be empowered by God. Come on, it means to be empowered by Holy Spirit, but appointed means when. Everyone say when. When God desires, when God ordains, when God decides to release the anointing. When God releases his results, because that's what the anointing is all about, y'all. When God decides to that which we were given the anointing for. Amen? See, this is where the anointment and the appointment meet. Mm. Come on, this is where the anointment and the appointment come together. David was about 15 years old. Any 15-year-olds in the house? Let me see your hands if you're 15-year-old. One, two, a few. The balcony, any young 15-year-olds over here? How many wish you were 15 over here? <laughs> yes. So David was about 15 years old when he was anointed as king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. But it wasn't until he was about 30, year old, 30 years old. How many 30-year-olds in the house? One, man, y'all are old. Come on, I know there's some 30s over here. Y'all ladies look like it. I'm saying you look young. That's a compliment. I wasn't saying that to y'all. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> again, how many wish you were in your 30s again? A few of you, all right? Those who... The kids have left the nest. They're like, no way. I'm good. <laughs> but it wasn't until David was in his 30s that he was appointed as king. Think about it. And that's in 2 Samuel chapter 2. And so a lot of time had passed in between being anointed and appointed. And how many think David could have been 
disappointed. See, a lot of pages in between. A lot of pages had been turned from his anointing and his appointing. A, a lot of chapters in between being anointed and appointed. David could have been disappointed, but regardless of how David felt, you don't want a 15-year-old ruling or leading your nation, right? Just like you don't want a 15-year-old leading this church or a 99-year-old incompetent fake president leading our nation. I, I don't know where that came from. I apologize. <laughs> or, or how about this? How can... And let me preach to the men. How can you be the head of the household if you're not walking in the Spirit? Hmm? If you're not spiritually there, you don't want, ladies, a man leading you that's not spiritual, scriptural. Hmm? Because he can't lead you in the right way. But his grace is sufficient. Amen? For all of you, if you walked in unscriptural, unspiritual, you can leave this place the opposite in Jesus' mighty name. But regardless, David had to be prepared. He needed time under his belt. He needed to, to know what it was like and how to lead people. And, and so God prepared him. He needed to be prepared. It was a lot that he needed to learn between being anointed and appointed. See, the worst thing that can happen is to be anointed by God but appointed by me or anyone other than God. Think about it. It's the worst thing that can happen to be anointed by God but determine when it's time and say it's now God this is you, you anointed me so now I'm going to appoint myself that, that's the worst thing that could ever happen see just because he was anointed as king doesn't mean it was time to be appointed as king the moment that God anoints isn't always the moment that he appoints right so don't be disappointed if you're anointed today but not yet appointed for the ministry or the position or the place that God has called you to do because listen if God anoints guess what he appoints in his timing on his clock on his day not ours and God has an appointed time to release you and to release the the your purpose in life but he has to get you ready right first right he has to prepare you so don't get disappointed in the process, the process of time. You can get disappointed in between being anointed and appointed, right? But the message isn't don't get disappointed because we've all been disappointed. The message is don't stay disappointed because there's almost always, always a time frame in between being anointed and appointed. It's a time, a space of time. Point number one, there's a space between anointing and appointing. Come on, there's a space, a, a, a space of time in between you being anointed and appointed. And it's in this space between anointed, being anointed and appointed that we get disappointed. But it's in this space that faith is required, church. It's in this space that faithfulness is required. And I'll go ahead and tell you that God will test your faith and your faithfulness in this space to make sure it's time to be appointed. And just because he anointed you doesn't mean it's time. He will get you ready before he releases you. So don't get too disappointed in the process. There's always a space. And I'm speaking from experience today. Nothing will test your faith and your faithfulness like waiting does. In verse 18, the Bible says that the Lord was with David. In fact, it says that multiple times in multiple verses, the Lord was with David. This was the theme of David's life, y'all. The Lord was with him, but David didn't always feel this, just like you and I don't always feel this, right? The Bible says, never will I leave you or forsake you. That's a promise of God, yet do we feel like God has left us at times? Does it feel like he's forsaken you at times? Some of you might have walked in today feeling like God has left you, but I promise you he hasn't. He said, never will I leave you or forsake you 
Not for a moment. Not for a moment in time has he ever walked out on me. See, Thomas isn't the only saint in this Bible who ever doubted. They all did. Come on, they all did at point, some point just like we all have. We've all doubted. You will have moments of doubt. You will have doubtful days. In fact, you will have seasons of doubt. And again, I'm preaching from experience, y'all. But it's in these moments and in these seasons that we have to choose to believe. We have to speak to our doubt. We have to remind our doubt what the Word of God says. So in these moments, pick up the Word, read it, speak it, say it, spray it, shout it, sing it if you have to. If you're one of those musical fans, I'm not. Although I do sing in the shower, y'all. Ask Tammy, I sound pretty good. And it's okay to doubt, but don't live there. Come on, don't, don't stay there. Be a believer, not a doubter. Right, but even the anointed doubted. Even this guy with the heart after God doubted. He had moments of doubt. He had seasons of doubt. Because he said this in Psalms 13.1. He said, how long, O Lord? And that's a question. Will you forget me forever? That's another question. And then a third question in this one verse. How long will you hide your face from me? How many think David was living in a season of doubt in this moment? Think about it. How many have ever walked through a season of questions like this? Questioning everyone around you, everything around you, every circumstance in your life, why things are happening, why they're not happening, why God's moving, why he's not moving. Anyone ever question God? Anyone ever have a season of questions like David? We've all felt this way, church. At some point, we've all felt this way. How many feel this way today? Some of you do. Some of you walked in. Some of you online feel this way today, and that's okay. But don't stay there. Don't live there, because what's true of David is true of you. The Lord is with you. Come on, I said the Lord is with you. If you've given your heart and your life to Christ, if you've received him as your Lord and Savior, notice I said Lord and Savior because he can't just be your Savior. He needs to be Lord of your life. He needs to rule and reign over your heart. And so if you've received him as your Lord and Savior, he is with you. He is always with you. He's with you today, tomorrow, and the next day. He's with you on your best days and your worst days and every day in between. He's with you. Can somebody praise God? He's with you this morning. I said he's with you. Never will he leave you. Never will he forsake you. But that doesn't mean that just because he's with you that nothing won't ever come against you. In fact, it might just be the opposite, y'all. Because he's with you, everyone and everything's going to come against you. The devil's going to come against you because God is with you. He's with you. We often quote Romans 8, 31, and I know you've heard it before. If God be for you. But notice this is a question, church. We, we quote it as a declaration, but David, but Paul <laughs> stated it as a question. It ends in a question mark, y'all. Hmm? That makes it a question. You didn't have to graduate from high school to know that a question mark symbolizes a question. It's a question. So let me answer this question for you this morning. In fact, why don't you ask me the question on three if they put it up there? One, two, three. You ready? Everyone and everything. I said everyone and every. Thing. And the more God is for you and the more you are for God, the more everyone and everything is coming against you. The more the devil's going to come against you. See, the moment you decide that you're going to get closer to Christ, start reading your Bible, going to church, listening to praise and worship music on the way to work, the more the devil comes against you. That's when he comes on the strongest. So the closer you get to Christ and the closer you get to your destiny, the more the devil attacks you, believer. The more he comes against you. He wouldn't attack you if there wasn't something inside of you. Or let me say this. If there wasn't something in front of you, there's something in front of you, believer. You have a future, believer, and the devil don't like that, so he's going to attack that. So be ready. And the more anointed you are, guess what? The more attacks that come against you. And I know you want to be anointed, 
but you got to be able to handle the attacks that come with the anointing and so God will prepare you test you and get you ready for the attacks so the main point of this verse Roman 8 31 isn't that nothing won't ever come against you it's that no matter what comes against you God is with you and for you come on no matter what he's always with you he's always for you how many believe that today how many believe that God is with you and for you I, I think that all of you believe it in some way but you don't always feel it hmm? I don't always feel like God is with me and for me it feels like sometimes yesterday everyone and everything was against me all right how many have had that kind of week where it felt like everyone and everything was coming against you but yet you knew you, you know what the Bible says God is with you or for you but you didn't feel it in the moment right some of you walked in that way today you've had that kind of week where you know what God's word says but you don't always feel it I know as a pastor I know I preach it weekly but I don't always feel it just like you don't David knew it church he knew it but he didn't always feel it and he had a reason to feel this way a really really good reason let me show you first Samuel 19 verse 9 the Bible says one night David was in Saul's home playing the harp for him and Saul was sitting there holding a spear when an evil spirit from the Lord took control of him I'm not going to preach on that little section of scripture that's a whole other series y'all but I'm not preaching it today you can ask someone older and more wiser than me Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear but David dodged and it stuck in the wall David ran out of the house and escaped so Saul wanted to kill David God anointed David as king but now the king is attacking David and, and Saul of all people should have known how the anointing of God works think about it because he was once anointed by God right he lost it but he was anointed by God he lost it through what disobedience but he should have known come on he should have known he should have known that when God anoints someone no one or no thing can stop it because if God anointed David who is Saul really fighting y'all on the surface it would appear like Saul's just fighting little old David the guy that's playing the harp I mean I mean who's gonna be afraid of a guy playing a harp like, like I'm not afraid of a guy named Cody <laughs> I, I mean it's like there, there's no fear in that but just like big old Goliath Saul wasn't just fighting little old David come on he was fighting big old God Almighty and, and how many know that you can't win a fight against God Come on, the same applies to God's anointed. You can't win a fight against God's anointed. David was God's anointed. Saul couldn't win a fight against him. And, and remember, David said to the giant, the big old Goliath, he said, you come to me with a, a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, whom you defy. We've got to remember those words. Come on, daily. Daily. From every attack of the enemy, we've got to remember every word that David prophesied. David spoke. David delivered. He, he, he dedicated to, for us. God's word is, is for us. It was spoken so that we can speak it, so that we can declare it. That was the word I was trying to say. David declared it, not dedicated. <laughs> he spoke it. We've got to remember these words, church. In every attack of the enemy, no, no matter if it's from someone or something, I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, 
in his power and his anointing or the words of Jesus when he said you are the church and no demon in hell will stop you or, or the words of Isaiah 54 17 that says no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every lion tongue that rises up against you in judgment will be condemned hallelujah church we've got to remember these words with every attack of the enemy whether it comes from someone or something remember God's word but that doesn't mean no lying tongues, no weapons, or no demons in hell won't come against you. They will, but they shall not prosper. Amen? They will not prosper in Jesus' mighty name. They can't. Saul should have known that. Come on, he should have known. He should have been spiritually mature enough to know how to handle this transition of kingship but he wasn't he didn't handle it appropriately nor scripturally he handled it selfishly he handled it immaturely he handled it fleshly think about it sometimes it's those who appear to be the most spiritual that turn out to be the most unscriptural the most selfish the most immature I can't tell you how many times I've left puzzled. I've been left puzzled and, and questioning things and people in church. And being a pastor, I, I have people that seem to be the most spiritual. I mean, they talk in tongues, they dance. They, I mean, man, they pray like warriors. But then they leave questions in your mind because of their immaturity and their unscriptural decisions and, and, and choices. It's like those who appear to be the most spiritual are the most unscriptural. Because flesh gets in the way. I said flesh gets in the way. And flesh doesn't do things appropriately. Flesh doesn't do things scripturally. Flesh does things selfishly and immaturely. Fleshly is the opposite of spiritually. That's point number two. Come on, fleshly is the opposite. The Bible says that the flesh and the spirit are always in conflict with one another. They will never, ever, ever, ever come in agreement with one another. Sounds like some of you and your spouse, right? You're always batting heads. You, you'll never come in agreement. That's the way the spirit and the flesh. Maturity is the fruit of spirituality. Think about it. Come on, maturity is the fruit of spirituality. You will never grow spiritually if you're not growing in maturity. It's impossible. Can't do it. And Saul should have been mature enough to know how to mentor David. Come on, how to help him in this moment. How to, to prepare him to be the next king. How to pour into him. But he didn't. He attacked him. He, he came against him. And we see this so much in the church and in the body of Christ. Instead of coming together, we split. We, we attack instead of defend. We hurt instead of heal. Instead of defending, we, we're in constant fighting. But that's not the way it's called or should be in the body of Christ. We're a family. And, and as you know, in your family, behind closed doors, you fight, right? Even those who have been married for 50 years you you have moments right where you disagree but yet you come back together you fix it and you work it out and you pray together and you stand together and you hold hands and praise God it's it's momentary it's temporary because you're family and so you stick together but instead of getting David ready Saul was out to get David think about it Saul was the sitting king. David faithfully served the sitting king. Think, he fought a giant for him. He played a harp for him when he was in bad moods. You know. he, he faithfully served him. And so Saul should have loved David. He, he shouldn't have hated him. He should have mentored him, not tried to kill him by throwing spears at his head and having him killed. But think of the symbolism. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says to put on the full armor 
of God. But one of those armors in, in verse 16, I want to read it. It says, don't forget. Somebody say, don't forget. I mean, there's a reason that the Bible says, don't forget to raise the shield of faith above all else so that you will be able to extinguish the flaming spears hurled at you from Saul or the wicked one, right? The devil. Do you see the symbolism there? So the key words in this verse, don't forget and above all else. Come on, above all else. We're talking about the whole armor of God, the full armor of God, and Paul says above all else. The shield, the shield, raise the shield, hold it up. What is the shield called? Shield of faith. What does the shield protect? Your faith. Come on, people. It's called the shield of faith, so therefore it protects your faith. It's not for decor. Church, it's not for looks. It's not so you can hang on the wall. It's not so that you can appear to be a warrior. No, it's to keep the devil from hitting you from all of those spears that he's throwing at you constantly throughout the day, trying to hit your head like Saul. Oh, my God, I pray that one of you gets this before you leave this place. God, speak to your people give great revelation in this moment the devil is throwing spears at you constantly he's trying to hit you he's out to get you just like Saul instead of getting David ready Saul was out to get him and even though David was anointed as king to be the next king, he probably didn't feel too anointed in this moment. Think about it. He didn't feel too blessed. He, he, he didn't feel like he was making a difference. He didn't feel like he was loved. He felt hated. He felt abandoned by God. Come on, God called him to this, but now it's like God's left him. He, he probably felt like he wasn't serving his calling or his purpose in this moment. He probably felt like no one loved him. He probably felt like he failed I'm going to keep going until I hit every single one of you because you all have feelings this morning. Even the big burly men sitting beside you have feelings. Look at them. A lot of times they hold it in instead of revealing it. But how many know feelings lie? Come on, I said feelings lie. 1 Samuel 27 verse 1 says, but David thought to himself, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. David thought to himself, church. Come on, he thought to himself. The Living Bible says he kept thinking. One Bible says, or one translation says he kept saying to himself, and so if David thought this, guess what? He felt it. Come on, what you think, you begin to feel. Right? So David thought it, and he felt it. And this is where most of us get into trouble. Our stinking thinking and our feelings get us into trouble nine times out of ten. Because our, what we think leads us. What we think, we believe. Our, our thoughts dictate our decisions. Our thoughts direct our steps. Think about it. David's thoughts directed his steps his thoughts and his feelings dictated his decisions and his thoughts resorted to fear instead of faith David dropped his shield y'all come on that's great revelation I, I picture so much more response than that so I'm going to say it again David dropped his shield y'all wow y'all are on fire man I'm preaching so much better than this Come on, how many times whew, in the middle of a battle, in the middle of attack, in, in, in the middle of difficulty, a storm, a season, did you just drop? Come on, you, 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 your, your fingers just got tired and, and you just let go of that shield and, and then boom, you're just open target for the enemy and he just 
one after the other, just boom, just piercing and hitting your thoughts, your mind, your heart, your, your life, your children, your friends, your coworkers, your classmate, and, and he's just coming at you in every direction because you've lost your shield. Come on, you, you dropped it, you set it down. How, how many have ever left home without it? Come on, don't leave home without it. Have you ever left home, went to work without the shield? Have you ever went to school, teenagers, without the shield of faith? Have you ever stepped into a situation and you forgot it at home? Think about it. The worst thing we can do is just drop it. Remember, the Apostle Paul said, above all else, don't forget. Don't leave it at home. Don't leave it at the door. Take it wherever you go because you're going to need it daily. He said, above all else, pick it up. Hold it up. Amen. David dropped a shield. He thought to himself, one of these days, Saul's going to get me, y'all. I mean, how many have thought that about the devil? One of these days, he's going to get me. He just don't quit. David feared Saul. But think about it. He had just defeated a giant, y'all. A flipping giant, y'all. I mean, a giant that, that no one else could defeat no one else could battle no one else could fight this giant not even Saul so Saul wasn't as big as Goliath he wasn't as tough as Goliath but David feared him come on David feared him he dropped his shield and the amplified it says David said in his heart so David not only had doubt in his mind he had doubt in his heart God's anointed doubted in the Message Bible, David says, sooner or later, Saul is going to get me. And he said, the best thing that I can do in this moment is to run, escape, get out of here. I just got to get out of here, y'all. I, I just got to run. I, I just got to escape this instead of face this. And how many times have we thought this way? I just need to run. Come on, the best thing I can do in this moment is run, hide, escape, quit, give up, walk away, forget about it, drop my shield, leave the church, leave my marriage, give up. How many times have we thought this? But see, it's when we allow our fear, our feelings, to dictate our decision, decisions that we go to places we should never go. Come on, we do things we should never do. We live a life that we were never called to live. Jump from place to place, job to job, spouse to spouse, relationship to relationship, addiction to addiction, church to church, and the list just continues on and on and on. But listen to me loud and clear. This is great revelation. David was never called to escape Saul he was called to replace Saul y'all it's the devil that gets you running hiding escaping dropping and hopping dropping your shield of faith and hopping from place to place or in David's situation from cave to cave hiding you're never called to hide from the devil you're called to face him stand off with him hold that shield of faith up but David said this in Psalms 13 2 he said, how long must I be confused? And hold on to that word confused because that's what half of our generation is today. Confused. And what's the next? And miserable. They're miserable because they're confused, y'all. Come on, I said they're miserable because they're confused. And then he said, how long will my enemies keep beating me down? The NIV says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and this is how David felt in this moment but if you read through the book of Psalms you know that he had many of these moments where he thought come on where he felt many commentators compare David's thoughts his emotions his feelings his life his journey of faith to a roller coaster up and down here and there back and forth 
One moment he's feeling defeated, the next he's delighted. One, one moment he feels like God, he's, he's affirmed, but the next he's abandoned. He, he goes from pain to praise just like that in a matter of seconds. If you read through the Psalms, it's like he's got issues, y'all, like bipolar issues that are beyond without his medication. He's just up and down, back and forth, here and there. And I'm not trying to downplay anyone's bipolar issues at all. I'm just, I'm just trying to get someone to relate. He had some moments in his faith, right? He was up, he was down, he, he was on a roller coaster ride. But isn't this true of all of us? Come on, isn't this true of all of us? Aren't we all up and down, back and forth, here, there? One moment we feel like God is with us, and, but then the next moment we feel like he's abandoning us. And one day we're full of faith, the next day we're full of fear or doubt. We're up and down. If we're going to be real this morning, we all have our days. We all have our moments. We all are on this roller coaster ride, right? Up and down. No one stays up on the mountaintop. None of us. We all have our up and our down moments. And even though David didn't feel anointed, he was. Come on, he was. Because your feelings don't make it true or not. Point number three. It's not true because you felt it. It's true because God spoke it. I said, it's not true because you feel it. It's true because God said it. Anointing isn't a feeling, y'all. It's an indwelling. I don't always feel anointed, Becky. I have my moments where I feel like I've lost it. It's gone. It's left me. I don't always feel anointed, but I know I am because God says I am. I know I am because I'm filled with Holy Spirit, y'all, so that makes me anointed. I don't always feel it, but I know I am. And so I can be standing on this stage right now and be anointed tenfold, but not feel it. And so I can be preaching a sermon where the anointing power of God is flowing, but me not feel it. Without me feeling it, because the anointing isn't just working in me, it works through me. It, it works in you and through you. And so you can be anointed by God, but not always feel anointed. Because being anointed isn't based on how you feel. It's not your feelings. Because you won't always feel it. How you feel doesn't dictate who you are or what you are. You're, a, you're God's anointed. Come on, he said you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people out there his own possession. You're the head and not the tail. You're on top, not the bottom. That's who you are. You are God's anointed, but you don't always feel anointed. Do you? Just like I don't always feel anointed. Many times we confuse who we are with where we are. Hmm? I'm talking about right here. Or, or right here in our hearts. and We confuse who we are by a feeling, by what we feel in, in, in the moment. You know, I'm, I'm beat down, I'm discouraged, and so that makes me a discouraging person. No, that was a, a moment, that was a thought, that was a feeling. We, we're confused by this feeling. We had this one ungodly feeling or thought one time, and then boom, that's who I am. But that's the way the devil works. He wants you to think you're defeated. He wants you to be confused. He wants you to think you're not anointed. But David was anointed whether he felt it or not. He was anointed because God said he was anointed. Because God anointed him through the prophet Samuel. He was anointed, y'all, but he didn't always feel anointed. Now stay with me just a moment. Let me go with this. We're all blessed. Each and every one of you are blessed this morning. I'm blessed, you're blessed, those online are blessed, but we don't always feel blessed, do we? But we're still blessed. Because being blessed isn't based on how we feel. It's based on what God has spoken, right? We're not blessed because we feel blessed. We're blessed because God said we're blessed, and we're blessed. I'm telling you, we're blessed. 
We're the head and not the tail, right? We're on top and not bottom. We're, we're blessed. His mercies are new every single day. So we're blessed daily, y'all. We are blessed. We, we live in the greatest nation in the world. We are blessed. But we don't always feel it. Sometimes we question our blessings. And Jesus even said, you're blessed when men revile you and persecute you, say all manners of evil against you, you're blessed. Does that feel like a blessing? If I come at you this morning, Becky, and just start naming these names, calling you out, attacking your character, does that feel like a blessing? Jesus said it is, though. Mm. See, the way we see things and the way he sees things is, that's why it says it's higher. It's higher. It's greater. It's different. But we're still blessed. I'm going to close with this. But before I do, somebody say, I'm blessed. God sent an angel to marry the mother of Jesus when she was just a teenager. Remember that? It's not Christmas. He sent this angel to tell Mary, this teenager, that she was blessed and highly favored. And that's in Luke 1, 28. But if you read verses 29 and 30, you'll find out that Mary did not feel blessed. In fact, the Bible says, word for word, that she was disturbed. She was confused and she was frightened in the moment. Not to mention she was knocked up, swollen, and pregnant, y'all. She didn't feel blessed, but she was blessed because God said she was blessed. And so you can not feel it, but be it. All right? We won't always feel like we're blessed, but we can know we are because God is always with us. Come on, he is always for us. Never will he leave us. Never will he forsake us. We are constantly walking in the blessings of God, whether we feel it or not. And I'm here to tell you that you're blessed no matter how you feel. If you wake up with a headache, you're still blessed because you woke up. If you've got problems, if you've got issues, that's all right, you're still blessed because God turns your issues into opportunities. You're blessed. If you're sitting in this service today, you're blessed. Come on, you're blessed, and not just by my preaching, Julie. And those who are online, you're blessed. And not just because you get to watch our live stream, you're blessed because God says you're blessed. We're, we're all blessed in this place today. We don't always feel it, but we are regardless of how we feel. I'm reminded of this song by Cain that says, I'm so blessed. It, I just love that so. I'm not just blessed, y'all, I'm so blessed. And, and it's repeated, I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. Hallelujah, praise God in heaven, I'm blessed, right? You are so blessed. Come on, you are so blessed. Joe, you're so blessed. Look at Karen. You're so blessed. You're blessed. We're all blessed this morning. Can, can we stand up for just a moment? Can we close this service with thanking God for his blessings? Come on, we're a blessed people. He, he is with us. He is for us. Never will he leave us or forsake us. We're blessed. More than we deserve, we're blessed. Father, I pray right now in this place that each and every person would get the great revelation and the recognition of their blessings. God, the, the blessings that they're walking in, living in, operating in today, tomorrow, and the next day. God, we're blessed. We're a blessed people. God, I don't always feel blessed. I don't always feel anointed. I don't always feel like I'm doing the best that I can, but I know that I'm blessed and anointed because you never left me. You've never forsaken me. Your mercies are new every morning. Your grace is sufficient for all of my failures, mistakes, and mishaps. 
God, I pray that each and every person would come to that revelation this morning. And before they leave this place, that they would understand that they are blessed and highly favored. Just as you spoke to Mary, the mother of Jesus, that we are blessed and highly favored because Jesus is Lord and Savior of our life. You hold the throne of our heart. And so we're blessed. God, if there's anyone that walked in defeated, they would leave here encouraged. God, if there's anyone that's addicted, they would leave here delivered. If there's anyone that's not saved, Father, that today would be the day of salvation in their life, that they would become a new creation in Christ Jesus on this day. And they could join the family and be blessed. We thank you for your blessings that are afresh daily. We thank you for meeting every need in our life. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our jobs. Thank you for our children. A whole nother sermon. They don't always feel like blessings. But they're gifts from God. We thank you. Father, I pray right now that as we wrap this up today, as we close this sermon out, this service, that you would move on every heart, every mind, every life. God, that we would leave here today knowing that you are the king of our hearts, king of our mind. You're, you're leading us spiritually, our thoughts, our feelings, and our decisions. Not our emotions, not our flesh our feelings come on can we repent for just a moment can we be real with God and say I've, I've failed fill this place with your grace and your mercy God touch your people right now in this moment